Good day, dear listeners. Steve Freda here with the Management Blueprint Podcast. And I welcome Per Schoffers um, to our show, who is a six-time CEO uh, pricing expert and author of The Price Whisperer, A Holistic Approach to Pricing Power. Welcome to the show, uh, uh, Per. Thank you very much, Steve. And, and um, uh, I'm happy to be here. And I, I hope we can, um, we're going to have a, a good conversation that's of interest and entertaining for the audience. Well, that's the goal. Uh, that's definitely the goal. So, so let's see if we can have that. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure we will. So uh, let's dive in. And I'm very curious about your journey because um, it doesn't sound like it was an obvious one to become a, what you call a price whisperer. Yeah. Um, you have been a, a serial CEO of different companies and you got to the point where I guess you must have discovered that pricing is important because now you talk about that. So, so please tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you arrive at that conclusion? Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, what, what is your uh, uh, trip and how do you arrive at becoming a pricing expert? Yeah, first of all, let me tell you this, that the, the price whisper um, is not something that I invented. I, um, uh, I was called the price whisper so many times that, that, that I eventually decided to adopt the moniker, but it's not something I invented. But um, my journey is, is uh, I'm natively Swedish, and um, uh, I got my first CEO job to establish and, and run a company in, in Switzerland, in Zurich. Um, and, uh, and that was really a challenge, you know, because suddenly I was um, tasked with start a company with, that I've never done before, tasked to be the CEO that I've never done, done before, um, uh, tasked to develop a, uh, the company to a sort of a powerhouse in, in B2B businesses over, uh, over Europe that I've never done before. And um, and it was in you know in Zurich, so it was in German, and I don't speak German, so so it was really challenging. But as 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 challenging as it was, uh, it was also so exciting, you know. Um, so so that that's that's the first step on on my on my journey. Next step was that I was really bought over by um, our main competitor, uh, which was a Japanese company. So so I ended up being CEO of the. Um, European subsidiary of that company out of London, and and over over about a three year period, I managed to quadruple sales, um, and um, then uh, um, <clears throat> it was time to sort of jump over the pond here. And I um, initially I, I established and ran a um, a, um, a division of a fairly large public company, and while I was very successful, the the company around me died. So. It didn't. It didn't help us very much. But um, uh, and then I had a you know another uh, four I think CEO jobs maybe five uh, before I um, you know do what I do. Um, and in all of those instances, we did some experiments with pricing, and some of those experiments were very successful. Like next quarter revenues are up twenty five percent. Others were complete duds. And um, what I had learned in business school and could read about pricing was so theoretical and academic that it was um, it, it, it was uh, useless information. It didn't help us to understand why some experiments worked and others didn't. So uh, 15 years ago, I decided I was too old and too opinionated to be a hired gun. So I set up my own uh, practice and and develop a, developed the pro, uh, process that would make every pricing experiment a success. Wow! So so what is it about pricing experiments which makes them difficult to codify and to uh, kind of systemize so that anyone can do it? Or maybe it is uh, codifiable. So why was it not tangible the success early on? Why was it a hit and miss process? And how how did yeah, you this discover is, how to make it uh, an intentional and uh, yeah this is this is how mo how most companies if if they do pricing experiments uh, and and many of them don't um, if they do pricing experiments they 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 sort of adjust the price a, a little bit up or a little bit down and see what happens right um, and 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 the, there's a uh, the, the the process I I developed. Um, is is much more scientific, if you like. 
because it, it everything you do in your company is um, eventually expressed into your customers' willingness to pay, right? And and if 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 you have, for example, if you have marketing messages that are not effective, um, your customers are not going to have a very high willingness to pay, and therefore we wouldn't support high high prices. Um, it could be that your sales methodology doesn't support higher prices. It could be that. Um, if you develop the product, um, you, you have in the company a misunderstanding of what product features and benefits that will support higher prices and so forth. And, um, and this, the, all of this means that, that, um, that everything depends. And should you actually do uh, testing, which you, you may want to do, um, let's say you want to try a dozen different price points. You want to try to see um, how uh, a dozen different feature functions benefit affects what people are willing to pay. You want, may want to try the efficacy of three different marketing channels, each with six different um, marketing messages or benefit statements. Try, um, try three different uh, sales channels or methodologies. Um, and... Um, um, and 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 in the end, uh, also try different, maybe um, uh, half a dozen stratifications of of your pricing strategy. And since all of these attributes, all all of these influence all the others, um, you'll end up with fifteen thousand combinations. Mm -hmm. You know. So so I'd like to dig into this a little bit deeper, but before we go there, I want to take a step back and, and, and ask you a really stupid question. Why is pricing so critical for businesses? Okay, the, 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 that's a very interesting question actually, because um, any, any company lives of profits, right? Um, sometimes you can have, um, friendly investors that support the, 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 the company for quite some time, but eventually you have to show a profit, right? And, um, and, and the, the um, um, pricing is, um, pr profit in any company only comes from three variables. It is the, the, the cost of whatever you're selling, um, and, and the cost of the entire operation. It is the sales volume or whatever the company is selling. And it's the price of that, um, whatever you're selling in the company. And, and if you really think about it, um, reducing cost um, works on a relatively small number. Uh, so if you can reduce your cost for the average company with 1%, um, profitability goes up with uh, five and a half percent, roughly, for, for again, for an average company. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, if you can increase your sales volume with one percent, uh, sales, uh, sorry, profitability goes up with an average three and a half percent. And that's obviously because um, both both um, uh, cost goes up because there's cost of goods sold and, and sales volume goes up. But if you can increase your price with 1% or decrease your discounting with 1%, um, profitability goes up with 11.3% for the average company, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I have something that I, that, I, I, that, I, that I call the 1% challenge. And the 1% challenge is really very simple. It is, have you ever failed to change anything one single percent? Right, and of course not. You know, so um, so for entrepreneurs who, who are looking at, at at their pricing and then discounting, it's it's about increase price with one, two, three percent, or de decrease your discounting. I mean, tell your salespeople that um, no, they can't discount twenty percent. They 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 are only allowed to discount up to eight percent. Right, and suddenly you doubled your profits. Uh, that's that's very compelling, but but how do we know even know that our pricing was right to begin with? 
So, um, say again, I, I don't understand. So how do we even, so it's, 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 it's a good thing if we can increase it by 1%, the, 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 the price revenue goes up 11%, great. But how do we know that our pricing was correct to begin with? Maybe we are not just one percent off. Maybe we are twenty percent off. Maybe we are fifty yeah, percent off. Absolutely, and 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 that is very very uh, common. And this is what comes out of this process that I developed and, and built a company around. You know, and and uh, the process consists of doing willingness to pay research. You can very accurately, in in online polling of a marketplace, uh, again with a methodology that we have delivered uh, developed very accurately predict sales volume and revenue at different prices and 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 when you then compare what what a market is willing to pay with your existing prices you very quickly know whether you should increase your price or decrease your price um, whether you should focus on um, uh, maximizing profitability or whether you want to focus on maximizing sales volume and and so forth and then in the in the, in the next step, um, it, those predictions of sales volume and revenue at different prices are then also um, segmented by different uh, different marketing messages, by different product features, by different benefit statements, um, by by different sales methodologies, uh, marketing channels, marketing you know. So so in the end, um, you 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 get the the result of um, all of that quote unquote testing that I was um, the the sort of fifteen thousand variables, um, you get the result of that in in you know in in a few weeks, right? Is there a risk to overcomplicating pricing? <laughs> um, at one point, yes, there is. At one point, uh, I was. Um, uh, I was the CEO of of a um, the, the U.S. subsidiary of a German software company, and and a fairly small company, and especially we did specialized software, and um, um, the, the 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 company prided itself of 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 having a development team and 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 so forth that was all PhD guys, you know. So there was out of the maybe 50 people in the company in Germany, uh, 35 or 40 of them were PhDs. And, and they had come up with a pricing strategy that was so complicated that nobody can understand it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand it. Um, our salespeople couldn't understand it. Certainly the customer couldn't understand it. And, and when I was complaining uh, about this, they, they, the answer I got was, Oh, we we want to try to hide what people are really uh, our prices, so they don't really understand how much they are going to pay, and and that was a, obviously not a very good tactics because <laughs> you, you want to know what you you, you want to pay, and and this this price list li lived in a in a in a spreadsheet with oodles of dependencies and and all different things and and. Uh, um, and I said, just scrap this, and and uh, we did. Um, you know, we just said this is this is this is the price based on on a couple of different variables. I, I think it was uh, number of users and and uh, and the size of the storage we used, and that was it. You know. Now I see the opposite as well, um, because in the past it was always the salesperson communicated the, the pricing, and it was part of the, I guess. Uh, you know, not revealing the price and, and uh, keeping it as a curiosity inducer uh, with the prospect so that you could present the price in the right way, you anchor them at a higher price, whatever, create the psychological circumstance when they, they would be easier to close. But now I see the opposite, that uh, these new uh, startup companies, digital companies, they often display the pricing on their website and the different packages are all transparent so what do you think of that what are the pros and cons of being transparent versus um you know opaque with your pricing well it, it really depends on the business um and um if if you're a company that sells a commodity or near commodity product of some kind 
<laughs> whether it's a, a, a service or a, or an actual product or a piece of software or whatever it is, um, then it's a good thing to have prices on the website because um, if in a commodity marketplace, the strongest um, the strongest um, purchase driver is a low price, um, and 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 because of that, you will. Um, buyers will do comparison shopping and and will in a commodity marketplace buy whatever is is cheapest now the flip side is that if you're not a commodity you should never have your prices on the website because yeah. then um i mean there's just no there's no point in having um prices on the website because you want to be able to deliver that value have that conversation um whether it's in person or digital or in some way um, with with a with a customer to deliver that value before you talk about what the price is. And, and in particularly again in a non-commodity market, your differentiators. You know? So yeah. No, I mean, that makes a lot of sense uh, to think it uh, think about it like this. Uh, because I, obviously if you are not a commodity but people expect you to be one and then they see your prices then they they just flip out and i think that you you've gone off the rails yeah pricing yourself like that and then they won't even contact you yeah let me give you an example here this is a, a company that it's a i think it's a 10 or maybe 15 billion dollar company in in the in the tech space and and they provide a, a valuable server service to the to their clients and and um, I had a call with them. This is a couple of years back. I had a call with them, and they said, "We are not profitable, right? We uh, and our investors are running out of patience, so we have to become pro profitable." But they continued and and and, and said, um, "But we can't raise our prices because uh, people are complaining about our high prices already, and we can't raise them anymore." So um, I. And they had their prices on their website, and they had a very long pricing page, uh, and and it's it started as you scroll down the pricing page to eventually come to the price. It was just message after message after message on um, how cheap they were, right? So it set it set an expectation of the buyer that the 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 prices would be rock bottom low. And it didn't matter what the prices was, they, they, the perception was that they were too high. So I, I told the company, just remove the pricing page from, from your website, mm -hmm. which they did. And, and then I spoke to them a few months later and, 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 um, and, and I said, how did it go? And he, the guy said, well, we doubled our prices. We took away the page, we doubled our prices and nobody complains anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know that is that is fascinating yeah uh, a pair let you ask let me ask you about this this idea of anchoring mm -hmm. uh, you know i recently read in a book that uh, it's really important that you anchor the expectations at a high price and then you make your case and then your price is going to look like a bargain yes. and i've seen this uh, i've seen people who sell from the stage do that uh, what is your thinking about that? Uh, is this a credible way to present price? And what are the pros and cons of this approach? Um, I, I don't think there's any cons. Uh, it's just something that we as humans um, cannot not compare two numbers when we're exposed to them. And, and in fact, this, this was uh, first uh, discovered in the early 50s when um, this was in a... In a uh, university in Chicago, I can't remember which one, um, but they ask students to um, to um, add up the number in in their in their social security number. So they got a number, right? You add add up the numbers in the social security number, and and the result is a number, right? And and then they asked and uh, the same students. Now, when you've done this adding up of the social security put down a random number. And there was a direct correlation between um, how high that social security number was and the, the random number they, they, um, they put in. 
so that's how anchoring really was discovered you know from a from a um uh, from a psychological pricing psychological point of view um and that's <clears throat> that's why if you do have price <clears throat> excuse me if you do have prices on the website um it you should always start with the highest price because that sets an, an expectation and in fact even um even to the point that you may want to have something that is extraordinarily expensive that may or may not even have a direct relationship with what you're selling and as we are reading top to bottom left to right mm -hmm. it should be up in the you know in the left corner mm -hmm. and in fact i've, I've um uh, you know I've, I've told this to um several restaurant uh, owners that i that i happen to to know and i said a menu is a price list eh so uh put something up in the left corner and um, it could be <clears throat> a family meal for for uh, you know for six people with all the accoutrements and all the um you know wine and beer and all the sort of a bundle of things that are extraordinary and it's going to be from the most expensive thing on the menu so it's going to be very very expensive and and nobody's going to buy it but um but it sits there only to be that anchor and um and i you know it it has worked every time wow i love it love it so it's some kind of a super bundle on the top left corner and then everything is going to look super cheap actually. yeah it's going to look more affordable yeah right yeah it's so, better to say that because cheap is, is a negative uh, exactly yeah. yes yeah. uh and 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 the same applies for your website if you have um if you do have prices on the website okay um, and and i mean just to give you another example we we i advised a um um a company who um they they have a some kind of trade show uh, i'm not going to say the name but uh, i told i told them um you know flip the website because they had different um different packages of, of tickets and and i said start with a start with the highest one and and um um the, the they they flipped the website or the the way i suggested and and <clears> made um uh, another couple of hundred thousand in 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 a week yeah that's definitely uh, definitely uh, very uh, interesting advice so um one of the things that we talked about in our pre uh, pre-talk is mm -hmm. defending pricing strategy so you set the pricing strategy you defend it mm -hmm. so the question is what is it about defending that's important and uh, do you have to defend it or it should be self-defensive your pricing how, how does it work uh, psychologically yeah the the well you you defend your pricing strategy by having a detailed knowledge of what product features and product benefits drives a higher willingness to pay mm -hmm. right and and that is something that is sorely missing in 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 most um in most companies you know um you have uh, and, and some companies have this strategy that i don't understand at all where they send out their salespeople. this is mostly b2b but they send out their salespeople with the um with 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 the instructions of um take whatever price you can get right <laughs> and and maybe uh having a floor you know so not not below a particular price but this this inevitably would would will lead to low prices right because um they they sales then will use low price as the the main decision driver um, whereas it really should be the particular benefits and that's um that's also uh, for example in 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 sales training um folks um are being said you never just send a proposal to somebody right what you do is that you walk through the proposal with the client because if somebody just send you a proposal um and i actually did it myself or somebody sent me a proposal the the other day and i do what everybody does i i i open the document 
and I scrolled down to the to the bottom, and um, and I looked at the price, not having read anything of the proposal, and and I said this is too expensive, right? And and I didn't even bother to read the rest. It was just uh, it was too expensive for what I had in mind, uh, and um, and um, uh, and that's why I had this company had this company sort of walked me through the, the the proposal maybe i maybe i would have said yes right because then they would have been had the chance to defend their prices now they just sent the proposal and and you know so um so that's their loss maybe my loss too yeah right? yeah yeah I, I was just thinking as you were explaining this that uh, I reluctantly agreed to participate in an RFP mm -hmm. two weeks ago uh, against my better judgment. Yeah, and uh, and I said the proposal I never heard from them, and I yeah. think that may have been exactly the reason. Yeah, exactly. And 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 um, uh, I actually got an RFP here Friday from a large company, and and um, in that case, they say that um, um, we are going to be invited to present the proposal. So we're not going to uh, just send it. So then it may make sense, but otherwise, in in, I mean, in in every RFP is almost always written to fit a particular a particular company that the that the um, um, you know the, the the issuer of the RFP already had decided for you know. So um, that is true. That is it's, true. it's it's um, it's it's it's. Is not something that um, uh, that is is worthwhile spending a lot of money, a uh, lot of time on. Basically, yeah, that's true. That's true. Good lesson for me. Yeah. Um, so we are getting to the end of the time mm. here, but I, I have one more question. I, I'm really uh, dying to ask you. So, can a low price be self defeating? So, can um, can a low price communicate a lower expectations of deliverables? And therefore, off-putting to a oh, it does. Buyer. It absolutely does. Uh, not not only does um, the, there's something called expectation bias, and uh, um, the price of a product or a service um, sets an expectation of quality and benefit or lack thereof. And and if you if um, if your price is too low, people will equate it with with inferior quality and benefits so they they won't buy it and we've all been there you know we hold something in our hands and we say i kind of want to buy this but this is so cheap it can't be any good mm -hmm. but then the other interesting thing is that um the price also affects um uh, customer satisfaction and 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 um there's been many many tests, but one of them is is we know that a a five cent aspirin is not very good curing your headache, mm -hmm. but a fifty cent aspirin is, right? Um, so so customer satisfaction is also directly related to price. Mm -hmm. And, and you uh, might even get better customers because they will have a higher expectation of the service. Maybe it's consulting. Yeah. So Good. they are going to, their attitude is going to be that we're going to get more out of this. So they're going to put more into it and yep. they're going to deliver the value to themselves. Whereas... Uh, do we have time for one more story? <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, we did this, 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 uh, um, this job for a, for a company who has a phone system in the cloud. And they were desperately uh, underpriced. And so we told them that they could actually quadruple their prices. Now, they didn't do it overnight. Uh, took them about nine months to do so. But um, the um, two things happened. And I obviously followed up with the CEO. And he said, after quadrupling prices, sales volume went up with uh, 25%, right? Um, but then he said, we also got a completely different set of customers, a more professional level of customers. So our customer support costs have gone down with 80%. Wow. Well, because when at the very low price they were, <clears throat> they were only attracting 
um, price sensitive customers. And price sensitive customers buy from you only because of low price. And so they obviously didn't bother to, to learn the product or use it in a proper way. They, they just wanted the low price. And as soon as the low price disappeared, they went somewhere else, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's true. So sometimes it's good to fire the low price customers and replace them with high price customers. Yeah. And exactly. everyone's going to win. Yeah, low, you, you fire your price sensitive customer. And it's the same thing when if you have products that are at the end of life, what you want to do is that you want to you want to uh, jack up the price very significantly. You're not going to sell many of them, but each unit by itself is going to be usually profitable. So. Okay, well. Lots of lessons, and uh, yes. I guess if uh, if you uh, listeners, if you want to get more of these lessons or get deeper into them, then you can buy the Price Whisperer, a yeah. holistic approach to pricing power. It is coming out tomorrow, right? August yeah, 9th. the the, kin the Kindle version is coming out tomorrow. The the um, uh, the hard copy is coming out on November eighth, I think it is. Okay. And and my publisher actually for the Kindle version has a price promotion, so it's only one ninety nine. And it's, it's a three hundred. It's a three hundred page book. Um, no, I don't like it. <laughs> but they they said this is what we need to do. <laughs> yes, to get to the number one spot. Uh, yeah, correct. You can raise the price later. Yeah, and for, for the audience here, the the best way of finding me and and the book, of course, is just to do a Google search on the Price Whisper. Yeah, the Price Whisper is up there. Uh, yes. So you can by by the time this show comes out, it will already have been published. Yes. So uh, so definitely pick up a copy, and um, you you know, pair you also are on LinkedIn. So I yes, I, I yes, obviously you. I'm I'm on LinkedIn. I I don't really use uh, other social media. Yeah, I do have Twitter and stuff like that, but I don't really use it. It's it's LinkedIn that that, that that's that, that's the business social media I live in. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, well, thank you for for coming and whispering uh, uh, us about prices, um, lots of good strategies and lots of things to uh, to chew on for our listeners and. Uh, for you uh, listening to this show, uh, stay tuned. Next week, I'm going to bring another exciting expert, CEO, entrepreneur to the show to share their management blueprint. Um, thank you, uh, Pear, for coming. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, and look forward to, uh, to uh, releasing the show. Thank you, Steve.